Well, if you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to Psalm chapter 91, and we're going to continue our series, The Truth About Angels, Demons, and Devils. And if you were here last time, we're just going to quickly review where we were and not going to re-preach it, and uh, that's going to take a long, long time. But Psalm 91, verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. You know what God is saying? You guys need help. And how many of you would agree with that? We need help. And God has help for us. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels. Now John, we call him John the Revelator, but the Apostle John is giving us a glimpse of heaven. I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousands, they circled the throne, the living creatures, and the elders. There is a term here that we're going to look at. It's called the Lord of the Sabaoth. Not Sabbath, but Sabaoth. Romans chapter 9, verse 29. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would be like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. And then in James chapter 5, James picks up this same thought. Verse 4, indeed the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. Say that with me, Sabaoth. Now let's all say it together, Sabaoth. So what does that mean? It's not Lord of the Sabbath, but Sabaoth. It means the Lord of the host or the Lord of the army. Now there's two different uh, inferences here. When Israel would go out to battle, they would go out in the name of the Lord of the Sabaoth. He is the God of the armies of Israel. But there is a different meaning there that God has his own army. And it's not a natural army. It's a heavenly host. And that term means the Lord of the host or the Lord of the army. And so that is indicative of God has his own army. And Jesus would even say to those who tried him, he said, the next time you see me come, I will not be coming the way that I came this time. He said, I'm going to come with all the holy angels of heaven. He is the Lord of the Sabaoth. He is the Lord of hosts or the Lord of the armies. And matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, when he comes back to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years, it says, and the armies, plural of heaven, follow him and it proves that he is the Lord of the Sabaoth. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion and to, a, to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So how many angels? An innumerable company, more angels than we can number. So God, as we talked about last time, created the heavens and the earth, and prior to the heavens and the earth, as we know the physical realm, there is a spiritual realm, so he created an innumerable company of angels, or heavenly hosts, and they sing out and they worship as God created what we know as the physical universe, and that is in the book of Job. So if we were uh, here last time, and if you were, angels are a class of beings created by God. Angels never represent uh, as a spiritual progressed human, so humans don't turn into angels. Uh, you've heard the line, some women are always up in the air harping about something, so that's not anything about that. So uh, some guy said that, I don't know. In, in Scripture, angels always appear to be masculine. An angel of God never appears to be an animal or a bird. They have intelligence. They are observing rational beings. They communicate in their own way, in their own language or languages. Angels have emotions. Angels have wills. And angels are ministering spirits. Now let me just pick up on the last uh, two there. Uh, God made angels to not only uh, minister to him, but to his creation. And we'll look at that in a moment. But when we say angels have wills, 
That means that they had the power of choice because Satan could have never fell from heaven and the angels could have not left their first estate or their first position unless they had a will to choose to do that. Otherwise, they would just be robotic in their behavior and they could only do what they were created to do. So let's begin the new information. You have a sharp pencil or a phone or an iPad there. Let's get into the next uh, phase of this. Angels minister to people and to God. Angels minister to people and to God. So Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 19, he has a glorious day in chapter 18. He faces the false prophets of Baal and of the groves. Jezebel is trying to hunt him down to kill him. He gets very depressed in chapter 19. He is under the tree wanting to die. He says, I know no better than my father. So the Lord had him sleep and the angels came to minister to him. And we jokingly said last week, it's the first reference to an angel food cake that we have, that the angel actually baked him some food. Jesus in the wilderness, he's, he's praying and fasting for 40 days. Matter of fact, uh, today we're beginning our week of prayer and fasting. So Jesus for 40 days. Now, let me insert this because Carrie and I were driving back uh, Friday and I was anticipating this week of prayer and fasting. And I brought this up and we talked about it just briefly. I said, you know, you think about, you know, two days, one day, three days, four days, five, whatever you choose to do. But I think about Jesus doing 40. 40 without eating. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that's impressive. So Jesus fasted for 40 days. And, of course, in his weakness, in his moment of temptation, guess who shows up? The enemy shows up. And so the angels, at that ending of his 40 days in the wilderness, came to minister to him, and Satan even reminded Jesus that the angels come to minister, and he began to quote that verse. The second thing, angels bring and deliver messages. Angels, angels bring and deliver messages. In, in Daniel chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, Gabriel gives Daniel the understanding of a vision. And Gabriel actually identifies himself to Daniel. Now, that's in the Old Testament. We're looking about somewhere around 700 years before your New Testament begins. And then the New Testament really begins after that 400 silent year in Luke chapter 1. We have angelic activity, angelic activity to begin again. And if you remember the statement from last week, whenever the Lord begins to do something, or he is going to appear, there is an increase in angelic activity. Yeah. Now, many of you have heard this. Many of the nations that are under Islamic control, these people now are having angelic visitations and dreams and visions about Jesus. Yeah. And so in Luke 1, Zacharias has a visit from an angel. And the angel begins to tell him about the birth of John the Baptist, as we know, and then uh, the angel identifies himself again as Gabriel. And then this progresses on. This young virgin by the name of Mary has what? An angelic visit. And then Joseph in a dream has another angelic visit. Do not be afraid to take Mary your wife so, as your wife. And so we have this uptick of angelic activity and there is messages that is being delivered to Zacharias and now to Mary and to Joseph and the shepherds in the field. The angels fill the sky and say, you need to go to, Jer to uh, Bethlehem for unto you this day is born in the city of David a Christ the Lord. So there's a savior there. So angels bring and deliver messages. Now, the next aspect, the next characteristic of angels, angels fight for and deliver people from danger. Psalm 91 verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Psalm 34 verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. And then Daniel chapter 6 verse 22, when he is put in the den of lions, uh, most of you know that the king really uh, could not go back on his decree, but he, he, he wanted Daniel to be alive. And in that morning, when the day broke, he, he cried out into the darkness of that den of lion, and he says, oh, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? And he says, oh, king, live forever. So l let's see what Daniel said. Verse 22, my God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouths, 
so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I've done no wrong before you. So Daniel confesses that the angels came and shut the lion's mouth. Now, I don't know what those lions saw, but I know one thing, that the angels had control over the lions, correct? And so the angels were dispatched to deliver God's people from danger. Now, the next aspect, if you will, of angels is that angels can execute the judgment and the wrath of God. And we see that throughout Scripture, Psalm 78, verse 49. He sent upon them his burning anger, fury and indignation and trouble, a band of destroying angels. This is Genesis chapter 19. Matter of fact, we studied that last Wednesday night when we got into the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, there are three that appear at the tent of Abraham. One is the Lord, two are angels. While Abraham and the Lord, and the, 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 the term for Lord is capital L-O-R-D, which is Jehovah. So, so why Abraham and Jehovah's having a conversation, the other two go on into Sodom and Gomorrah, and we find them at the gates and in Lot's house. And then we hear this. Um, this is verse 13. We are about to destroy this place, and it's Sodom and Gomorrah, because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord sent us to destroy it. So we're going to destroy these cities of the, the plains around the Salt Sea, and the angels were there to destroy it. Here's another aspect. Angels can be dispatched to answer prayer. Now, think about this man by the name of Cornelius. He is an Italian centurion. He really doesn't know God, but he knows there is a God. He wants to know God. So he prays and gives his alms or he gives his offering to the poor. He's trying to be very civic. He's trying to be very uh, magnanimous, uh, you know, beneficial to people. He knows there's something bigger than him. Do you think maybe he is a little disenamored with the gods of the Greeks and the Romans? And he's saying there must be something bigger than this. And so as he prays, God sends an angel to Cornelius. And he has an answer to his prayer to go get Peter, and Peter preaches the gospel. We also know in Daniel's time, and we're going to read this verse here in a minute, that Daniel prayed for 21 days, and then there was an angel dispatched to answer the prayer of Daniel. Here's another one. Angels can appear to be human, and we can be unaware of their true identity and purpose. And some of you, I've heard your testimony, your story, the possibility of having an encounter with someone that seemed a little different. They were here, they were gone, they came to help, and were they angels? I don't know, but this is what we know. Hebrews 13, 2, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels, and we say we have entertained angels unaware. So you may have entertained an angel and never knew it was an angel. So uh, how, how could we entertain an angel unaware? Because they did appear to be human. Now, if they were 10 foot tall and had a 12 foot wingspan, I would have noticed that. How about you? But... We have entertained angels unaware. I think every day we entertain angels, but we can't see them. I think Jesus is very clear that we do have angels that uh, are our guardians. Uh, the psalmist says angels camp around us and that we're in the company of angels. And so I believe angels are right here with us. And I have people tell me that they have seen angels in, in our services before. But... They have to be revealed to us or we have to be in a spiritual state to see that which is spiritual. It's hard to see spiritual things with carnal eyes unless there's a revelation or opening up of that dimension to us. And so that's why the writer of Hebrews says that. Now let's shift gears and, and this is really where I want to get into the meat and the heart of the matter tonight because we need to know what the Bible informs us of. There's some things we don't know, we see through a glass darkly, but there's some things we can know. How many of you believe there are things we can know? So I got home about one o'clock this afternoon. Uh, I, I had a very busy day today, uh, not only the services today, but I had some other things I had to do in ministry. So I, I sat down in my recliner for a little bit, 
And so I missed the first hour of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the uh, Philadelphia Eagles playing. So we have Tom Brady and uh, Jalen Hurts, and, and both of them are great guys, uh, great quarterbacks. And I heard the comment somewhere in the game, so when Tom Brady is, is playing football in football playoffs, Jalen Hurts is three years old. So I think, okay, that gives you a little perspective. But the point is this. Both of those teams going into the playoffs, I'm going to guarantee you they've studied the other team. They know their strengths. They know their weaknesses. They know their players. They know who is on injured reserve. They know maybe somebody who is wounded or hurt in, in the process of a previous game or the season. So those coaches, those players have spent hours and hours and hours studying not only their strengths, but the strengths of the other team or the weakness of the other team. Let me tell you, we're not in a game, but we're in a struggle. We're in a battle. So it makes sense to me that we should try to know who our adversary is and also who's on our side. Would that make sense to you? We need to know who's for us. We also need to know who's against us. So in study this, studying this, then we have a sense to know we're on this team, they're on our team, if you will. We also know, we'll get to this the next time we teach, who is opposing us? What are the characteristics of those who oppose us? How do they operate? Paul said this, we're not ignorant of their devices. We're not ignorant of their strategy. So we need to know. So let's shift gears here. Angels seem to be classed and structured according to their purpose or purposes. So when we look at angels, angels tend to have certain positions and purposes, and it looks like they're classed according to that. Now, I'm not going to give you from top to bottom, bottom to top, but let, let's just you know, address this. So we know there are different names or different descriptions to these heavenly beings, these ministering spirits, or these angels. So let's take the first one, cherubs. Have you ever heard the term a cherub? And this is what our Western modern world has done since about the Renaissance. So we have these chubby little fat buttocks, little baby looking entities with wings, with bows and arrows. I don't think that's what God's cherubs look like. I hate to burst your bubble, but I don't think that's it. So cherub, singular, or cherubim, which appears to be plural. What is that? Who is that? So let, let's look and see what the Word of God says. We feel like from the Word of God that the cherub or the cherubim guard and vindicate the righteousness of God, and they guard the government and the covenant of God. So why would we draw that assumption or that truth out? This is Genesis chapter 3. Most of you know, Adam and Eve are in the garden. Everything is perfect. God did give them a will. They chose their will to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, they transgressed the law of God, and God drove them out of the garden. So this is verse 24, Genesis 3. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, or we would say to guard the tree of life. So God dispatched the cherubim to guard the Garden of Eden. Here's a good question, why? Well, I think one of the reasons why, and you may disagree and that's fine because this is purely conjecture on my part, I think one of the reasons why is God did not want Adam and Eve to go back to the tree of life and eat that tree in a fallen state. Let me say that again. I don't think God wanted them to go back into the garden, eat the tree of life in a fallen state. But God had another plan. Thank God God's got a plan, right? Now, he put a guard or guards at the entrances of the uh, garden, and it is the cherubim. So when we say the cherubim guard the righteousness of God or the, the government of God or the covenant of God, do we see that somewhere else in Scripture? 
And the answer is yes, we do. Exodus chapter 25, verse number 18. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of beaten work shall you make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. So one of the things that God does for Moses, he gives them a pattern, a pattern of the tabernacle in the wilderness. He gave David a pattern of the tabernacle that Solomon would, would be building. But one of the things he did, and if you ever watch the History Channel, Learning Channel, we're always looking for the Ark of the Covenant, aren't we? So we have descriptions of it. We know what's in it. We know how to carry it. We know how it's fashioned. It's wood overlaid with gold. It has a lid on it. Inside is the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded. There is a container of the manna that fell in the wilderness. So there's certain things that we know is inside the Ark of the Covenant. But on the lid of that Ark, or on both ends, we don't know if it's on the lid or on the edge. I'm not exactly for sure. But we know that there are two cherubs or cherubim that have their wings stretched out over the top of that ark or the ark of the covenant so what are those cherubs doing they're guarding the entrance and the contents of the ark of the covenant why is God giving Moses and David some of these uh, patterns and, and these plans because this is my opinion, he's pattering the things on the earth of what's actually in heaven. So we have fashion golden angels of cherubim guarding the law of God and, and the things of God in that ark. But I believe there are real cherubim in heaven. They're guarding the things of God. Because we're going to read in a moment that ark reappears. Maybe not the same one, but reappears in heaven. So maybe that's why we can't find it. Don't know. Um, Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightning, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. So whatever Moses and the children of Israel fashioned on the earth, there is a true, there is a true in heaven. Now, you know, I, I'm thinking about some of the pattern that David gave. And when that ark was placed in the Holy of Holies, when Solomon built the temple, there wasn't just the cherubim that were fashioned over the lid of the ark. Now, you might want to go back and reread this. But there were huge cherubim in the Holy of Holies that was stretched out over that ark in, in addition to those that were on the lid or the sides of the ark. So there was huge cherubim fashion guarding the Holy of Holies. So think about in heaven, in the Holy of Holies, in the intimate presence of God, is there cherubim guarding the righteousness, the sanctity, and the government, and the covenant of Almighty God? And I believe there is. So there's the cherubim. Here is another class or another group of angels or heavenly hosts or creatures. It's the seraphim. Say that with me, seraphim. Now, you may not have heard of these. They're mentioned in the Bible. Uh, the definition or the name seraphim means the fiery ones. They look like they're on fire. They're, they're, they're glowing like burnished brass. And what they do, they proclaim the holiness of God. This is Isaiah chapter 6, beginning verse 1. And many of you know this. In, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, he's high and lifted up. So King Uzziah, and let, let's give you a little history here. King Uzziah was a very good king. He, he did a lot of great things. He restored the temple of God. He cleaned it out, got rid of some of the idols. But here was his downfall. Many of you know the story of King Uzziah. So King Uzziah, in his later years, he was so successful that one day he went into the temple and he was going to offer the sacrifice and the priest tried to stop him. And and I always paraphrase it this way. They said, King Uzziah, you're the king. You do king stuff. We're the priests. We do priest stuff. And he said, no, I'm going, to offer, I'm going to offer the sacrifice. Now, number one, that was not his office. And he did not have the anointing to do that. But I want you to think about this. Some people have the anointing other people don't have. 
doesn't mean they're, they're less. It just means you may have the anointing to do something I can't do. I may try, but I can't do it like you because you have the anointing to do it. But David, as a type of Christ, he had the anointing to be king, priest, and prophet because it was showing us that when Jesus came, he is the king, he is the priest, and he is the prophet. How many of you know? I mean, he fulfills everything. But he's God in the flesh. So when King Uzziah tried to offer the offering and the priest tried to stop him, when he got out of his lane, is that all right? When you get out of your lane and you're not anointed to do it, you're not called to do it, the Bible says he broke out in leprosy. Well, as soon as he breaks out in leprosy, guess what he does? He defiles the temple. Because no one with leprosy is allowed into that inner court. You had to be outside. So as soon as he broke out in leprosy, the priest extracted him from the temple and he died in a leper colony. So it makes me want to stay in my lane. <laughs> but the, 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 the point being here is that King Uzziah is dead. And I'm sure Isaiah is saying, Okay, now what do we do? Where do we go? I mean, what's going to happen to Israel? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. Now it's interesting to me that the, the, the seraphim here, they literally, in the presence of God, they covered their face. I wonder if they ever peek. <laughs> Do you remember God saying to Moses, no one can see me and live? Right. Right. If you looked at me face to face, Moses, in all of my glory, here again my translation, you'd be a crispy critter. <laughs> and even when Moses gave the request, Lord, let me see you, and the Lord said, this is, what I'll do, I'll hide you in the cliff of the rock. I'll pass by with my glory. You'll see my hinder parts. You'll see my afterburner. So here in the presence of God are the seraphim. Now let's go back to the definition, the fiery ones. The ones who look like they're glowing. The ones who look like they're on fire. Where does that come from? They're continually in the presence of Almighty God. Remember when Moses got in the presence of God just for a while and he came down from the mountain? What happened to his face? His face was glowing so much that he had to wear a veil over his face. Now, I've had people say, you know, uh, I don't want to look at your face, <laughs> but not for that reason. But Moses' face shone so bright that literally he veiled his face because he had been in the presence of God. He had been in the presence of the glory of God, the Shekinah of God, the, the, the majestic nature of God. And now these seraphim, they are there, and they, they hide their face, they cover their feet, and they are suspended and flying around the throne. Here's the third one, archangels. Now, this is something that you've probably heard, right? Archangels. Now, it appears, there again, conjecture, so we're trying to you know, bring things out of the scripture that we, we can get a little uh, traction with. It appears there may have been three in leadership over a triad of angels. Um, the Lord tended to operate in groups of threes. And so now we have these archangels and they're found in numerous faiths, not just the Christian faith. In Judaism, there are archangels. In Islam, there are archangels. And Michael and Gabriel are the two notable ones that we see in Scripture. And we, we feel like that Michael was uh, in a certain position, but the other um, different religions actually name, and you may have heard some of these names, other archangels. We have Raphael, Azrael. These are two names that were added later by some of the Jewish and Islamic writers, although they do not appear in your Bible or in any of the older uh, transcripts. Um, so Raphael means God heals. Um, uh, Azrael uh, is considered to be the death angel. We don't know that. This is just in some of the writings. But if there was originally a triad 
or a structure of angelic beings. This is what we know. We know that Gabriel was over the messenger angels, right? He's always delivering messages. We know that Michael is one of the warring angels because he is making war with Satan in the heavenlies. Uh, we also know in, in Daniel's case, we'll read that here in a moment, when the messenger angel couldn't get through with the message to Daniel, Michael, the great warrior, came and fought his way through to deliver the message. How many of you are tracking with me here? Yep. So, so we have messenger angels, we have warring angels, and could it be, th 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 just, just a thought here, could it be that Satan was over the worshiping angels? Because it appears that he was created with praise and music within him for that specific purpose. And when he fell, then much of that fell with him. And maybe we are added in to make up that loss. I mean, you know, we ought to be worshiping and praising God. So th th there is, you know, some dynamics here that we may see in this structure of what we would call a archangel. Uh, here's number four. Number four is the Zoa, and in the New Testament revelation, they're called the living creatures. So the Greek word is Zoa, and we get a word from that zoology, which is what the study of life and especially creatures. So the Zoar, the living creatures, are very similar to seraphims. Revelation 4, and uh, we're, we're going to read uh, verses 6 through 8 here in a moment. But these living creatures are giving glory and honor and thanksgiving to him that sits on the throne. Verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. Now, this description that John sees in Revelation 4 is much like the description that Isaiah sees in Isaiah 6. And there are other passages that when these men are caught up in the Spirit and they see this scene around the throne of God, many of the descriptions they give are very similar. If you describe something and 700 years somebody else describes something and then 60 years somebody else describes something and the description is very similar, then I would say somebody saw something. And so in Scripture, these are very similar. So there is a throne. Around the throne are living creatures full of eyes, front and back. They see everything, right? The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf or an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So around the throne of God, we have the seraphim, we have the living creatures. Other scripture says there is an innumerable company of angels around the throne, and they're worshiping the one who is on the throne, and that's Almighty God. And these continually cry out, notice this, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now when they stop that, they repeat it again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, why do they keep repeating this over and over and over? My opinion again, you cannot exhaust how holy God really is. You, you cannot exhaust how mighty God is. And you also declare He is the God who dwells in all space, time, and eternity all at the same time. Notice this. He is the God who was and is and is to come. He dwells in the past, he dwells in the present, and he dwells in the future all at the same time. You can't do that. I can't do that. But God can. He, he is outside the dimension of time. 
We, we teach this, uh, Randy, I, and different ones, we teach this sometimes in Let's Get Acquainted class. Uh, many times we mention it in mentoring class. So the psalmist said, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. So when Mr. Einstein came along, he gave us the theory of relativity. You may remember that. E equals mc squared. If you can accelerate mass at the speed of light, it quits being mass, it turns into pure energy. And when it turns into pure energy, it defies time as we know it. That's why they made a lot of B movies in the end of the 40s, the 50s, and early 60s. We send somebody to space, they go out, and they come back, and everybody on the earth is old, but they're still young. I need to make that trip. <laughs> so why did they do that? Because Mr. Einstein said this, if we can accelerate something at the speed of light, time loses its hold on it, and now time does not affect it. And the Bible said that before Mr. Einstein figured it out, that God dwells in light, in him there is no darkness at all, and time does not affect him at all. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like what? A day. Not to you, not to me, but to him, he sees it all at one moment. He knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the ending. He is the God who was and is and is to come. Now, let's look at this, uh, you know, nature of these living creatures of the Zoa. That's the Greek word. Um, if you underline in your Bible, if you're taking notes tonight, there are uh, four instances here of descriptions. Lion, ox or calf, man, and a flying eagle. But the word that precedes each one of them is the word like. I've noticed the generation before me like that word like. Have you ever had a conversation with a Gen Z or... A millennial, uh, it's like, uh, like, 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 I'm thinking, quit using the word like. You're wearing me out with the word like. Has anybody ever noticed that? Okay, that has nothing to do with the sermon, but uh, just the thought. So the word like here is the Greek word um, that is in each one of these, homoyos. And it means similar to or resembling. So in light of that, do these creatures literally have the face of a lion, a calf, or ox, or a man, or an eagle? Uh, we know they have four faces, and this is what they're like. So it could be this is exactly what they have, or they are similar to or resembling these. But either way, there's something I think we glean from these zoa, these living creatures, because I think each one gives us a little indication of the trait of God. And really should give us a really a trait of us as worshipers. Because the living creatures of the Zoa, they're worshiping around the throne, right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So our worship should be, we should be bold as lions, correct? We should have that kind of faith, that's worship. We should have the face of a calf or an ox. Now, to me, that, um, that addition is a little, um, I guess, why is he given the face of an ox? That would not be a compliment for most of you, would it? Hey, I want to compliment you. you got a face like an ox. Lion, maybe. Ox, not so much. But think about the characteristics like each one of these. A lion, regal, kingly, strong, bold, faithful. Ox can get in the harness and just work. Steady, plodding, plowing, busting up the sod, getting the soul ready. Aren't you glad we have people in the church, people in your life? They're just steady, they're strong. They get in the harness. They just pull. You can depend on them. They're not here one day and gone the next. You see them about six months and you wonder what happened to them. Thank God for some strong, steady worshipers. They're just faithful. You can depend on them. Then 
like a man. I mean, we worship out of our own humanity. We're created in the image of God and in the likeness of God. We're not God, but we're in the likeness of God. So we worship in our humanity. We're fallen and he has lifted us up. The fourth living creature was, uh, has a face like a flying eagle. So here we have someone that lifts up the eagle, soaring, tremendous vision, sees things that other you know, animals can't see, dwells in a dimension that others don't dwell in, in the heights. And the Lord told Israel, he said, I led you like an eagle through the wilderness. So all of these are wonderful attributes, lion, ox, man, flying eagle. And this is the the description of those who are around the throne worshiping and they rest not day nor night. And there is no day nor night as uh, uh, we would know it in heaven. But for our benefit, you know what he's saying? Continually, they're worshiping. And they're worshiping continually. So here is another attribute, number five. Another class is ministering angels, ministering angels. Now we talked about that, but I want to get a little bit deeper into that. Those who are ministering to and for the heirs of God. So we know that when Lot is in trouble, two angels smite the Sodomites with blindness. That's in Genesis 19. We also know in 2 Samuel 24, an angel brings pestilence to Jerusalem. Last week, we talked about 2 Chronicles 32, 21. An angel comes down and smites the Assyrian army. So King Hezekiah is in place as the king. He's the king of Judah. The Assyrians come in. They're trying to take over not only just Jerusalem and Palestine, but the entire country and other countries and kingdoms and cities. And the general for uh, the, the Assyrian king, he tells Hezekiah, there's no way you can withstand us. We've defeated every city. We've defeated every country. Their gods could not save them. And Hezekiah, not knowing what to do, he took that threatening letter to the altar of God and he said, God, here's what they're saying. And God responded and God answered. And this is what God said. They will not breach this city. They're not going to fire one arrow against this city. He said, they're going to leave different than the way they came. And that night, one angel came and killed 185,000 Assyrians, one angel. And I said this last Sunday night, that's a bad dude right there. One angel. The death angel went through Egypt the night before they left for the Exodus. And all the firstborn males that weren't under the blood, they died because God dispatched an angel. So angels can be dispatched to answer prayers. Now let me read to you, because I think we need to get this down. This is Daniel 10. We alluded to it previously. Verse 10, suddenly a hand touched me. This is Daniel giving us this description, this account. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. So we know that Daniel is on his hands and knees on the floor. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. So picture this. Daniel is praying. He's praying. He doesn't have an answer. Have you ever answered, uh, I mean, have you ever prayed and you felt like God didn't answer you when you prayed? Sure, I think we all have. I have, I think you have. So we prayed, we said, God, when are you going to answer me? And so Daniel, 21 days, he's praying, no answer. God, God doesn't respond. Well, God responded because we know that God heard the first day. But, you know, there is the war in the heavenlies. There's something going on in the spiritual dimensions. And Daniel is really informed about that, and now we get that information. God sent the answer, 
But the enemy didn't want the answer to come, so there was war, if you will, in heaven. So sometimes when you and I pray, when we fast, you know what we're doing? We're doing spiritual warfare. Now, when this messenger angel said, you know, I was kind of hung up in traffic. (laughs) You know, the prince of Persia withstood me these 21 days. But here's another class of angels. Michael, who's what? The warring angel. He came down. He subdued and fought against the prince of Persia so I could get through with the message. So here again, we see kind of a category or a structure here of the angels and what their duties are. And he says, I'm here to make you understand what's going to happen. And here's the message. So those are ministering angels. Another thing that we have to realize, and let me reinsert this again, that angels appear to be human and we can be unaware of their true identity. And back to... uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, do not uh, forget to entertain uh, strangers for some by doing have unwittingly entertained angels. So we, we have to be careful that we don't really get hung up that we don't live in a supernatural world every day because we do. We live in a supernatural world every day. And this is another thing that you need to know. Angels do not die. They're created beings. They're, they're going to live throughout eternity. Now, there is a scripture we read last time where the Lord spoke to the fallen angels or the little G gods, and he said, you shall die like men, meaning that you're not going to spend eternity with me. You're going to be separated with me like men who reject me, and you're going to be in a bad place. And then Jesus refers to this in the New Testament that hell was not created for man, but hell was created for the devil and his angels. And so if we go to hell, we're going to go there because we followed the way of the wicked one, and we did not take hold of salvation and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's the only way you're going to get to heaven. Now, I know there's a lot of people saying, well, you just have to be good enough and you have to be moral enough and it doesn't make any difference what you believe or what religion, we're all going to go to the same place. Oh, no, the Bible does not teach that. And let me tell you, if you're a visitor tonight and you're in a church somewhere and they teach that, run! Because it's not biblical. Because we have a place that God has prepared for us And we don't want to go to the other place. So angels do not die. Now the last one, my time has run out, but the last uh, thing I want to share with you tonight, we touched on it just a little bit last time, is this very interesting uh, topic of spirit animals. So when God created the heavens and the earth, he created not only the heavens and the earth, but he created the animals. And it appears the animals would have been on the earth until that moment that Adam sinned. And when Adam sinned, not only did the curse of sin, which is death, the wages of sin is what? Death. So not only did Adam and Eve fall, everything fell with Adam and Eve. In some way, the whole universe fell with Adam and Eve. Because until that fall, death was not known. You, 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 I mean, you couldn't kill anything. There was no death. Aren't you glad there's going to come a day there is no death again? So the Lord's going to put things back the way he said, now listen, this is the way I originally meant this. You messed it up, but I'm going to, I'm going to restore it back. And then in the eighth chapter, I believe it is of Romans, Paul writes this. He said all of creation is groaning right now. Isn't that odd? That creation is groaning. So what is creation groaning about? This fallen condition, not only of man, but all creation fell with mankind, and this is what creation knows. Waiting for the redemption and the, and the regathering of putting things back the way God originally meant it to be, The creation knows when that happens, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and God's going to put things back the way it originally was supposed to be. 
How many of you are looking for that day? Now, the Bible refers to that. And let me just reiterate this again. There's going to be a day that we beat our swords into plowshares. The king of kings is going to come and he's going to reign on this earth for a thousand years. And this is his entrance, not the rapture, but his entrance. Revelation 19, verse 11, Now I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies, here's these armies, the Lord of the Sabaoth, in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So, um, I don't know about you, but it seems to me like these horses that are riding back to the earth are just not like your natural horses on the earth. I mean, I've never seen a horse that could go through heaven and come back to the earth. And I don't know of a lamb that would lay down with the lion right now. And I don't know of a baby that ought to be playing over the hole of a serpent that's poisonous right now. And uh, I don't know of a, a lion and, and a wolf that eats straw or grass like an ox right now. How many of you are with me? But the Bible says one day that's going to happen. And why does that happen? Because the Lord puts things back the way he originally created it. And all the animals, all the animals prior to the fall, did not eat each other. They were herbivores. And God gave them, you know, the grass and and, and the things to eat. And um, it was a different world. But it seemed like when the fall happened, everybody just turned on each other. Kind of like today, isn't it? It's just like like we turn on each other. But I want to tell you something. It's not always going to be that way. God has a plan. But here's the good thing. J- just like the Eagles scouting out the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, they didn't do a very good job today. I'm just going to tell you if, you, if you got it DVR'd, sorry. But just like Tampa Bay checking out the Eagles, the Eagles checking out Tampa Bay, wh- what are they doing? I-, I need to know. I need to know what this team is like. I need to know who are the players here. You know what we're doing tonight? We're finding out who's for us. We're finding out who they are. What's their characteristics? What do they do? How do they help me? Can I cry out to God and God would help me with a heavenly host? Well, that's what he's been doing ever since the fall, right? So you go out in the city of Dothan and, and uh, you know, you're, you're, you're the aid to the guy inside. And you walk outside and there's the entire Syrian army circling you around. And they're not there for a vacation. They're after one guy. And his name is Elisha. And you're his buddy. Not good. And he goes back in and he says, Hey, boss, you need to come outside. It's not looking good today. And Elisha goes out with his servant and he sees... The army of the Syrians has them circled. No way out. And Elisha turns to his servant and he says, Lord, open up his eyes. And his servant looked. And the Lord of the Sabaoth, the God of hosts, the God of the armies, had their enemy surrounded. He said, God, open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, he saw the armies of God had the armies of Syria surrounded. And I'm sure he said, I think we're going to be okay. They're on our side. I mean, you know, God's on your side. Stand with me tonight.